I um, will be your host for today, uh, together with uh, our inspiring outreach uh, coordinator, um, calling in from Moldova. Uh, so I would like to please welcome Victoria Karchmaru. She will also be your moderator for today. So just before we dis uh, I go into the panel, I just want to give some, uh, explain some house rules. Uh, everybody's mic and camera off uh, today. However, we really encourage your engagement in the discussion. So please use the chat that is located in the bottom of your screen. So we will be monitoring the chat functions for questions or, or um, insights from your side. So please use that uh, function throughout the sessions. And we do have an allotted Q&A session at the the end of this panel. So also to set a little bit of the scene for this discussion, you know, we are in a challenging times, uh, particularly when we're looking at climate change. And a lot of the issues around climate change are often associated with Earth's um, activities that are associated with the Earth sciences. So uh, this often gives a negative view on the earth sciences and leaves our community also questioning what our role will be in building a sustainable future. So I'm very excited today to be welcome, welcoming our panelists today to help us in the discussion to find solutions on how we can change this narrative into a more positive one and how we can best uh, improve our geocommunication to the wider public to uh, create a more positive outlook on our discipline and how and what roles we can play in a sustainable future, uh, both for society and our planet. Uh, so without any further delays, I would like to uh, bring our panelists on the floor. Uh, if everybody, um, yeah, uh, when I introduced you, if you could uh, just give a brief introduction about, of, of yourself, that would be really great. Uh, we can start from the top of my screen. So, uh, Ed, can you, uh, uh, Dr. Ed DeMolder? Yes. Hi, this is Ed DeMolder. Um, I'm retired now, but I, uh, I'm still a geologist and I'm raised in the ranks of the Geological Survey of the Netherlands. Um, uh, I was... Um, in charge of mapping the the, the Netherlands, the, the subsurface of the Netherlands, because there are no mountains, and uh, and I was also uh, strongly uh, involved in uh, geological advisory work from the survey. Before uh, I was, uh, I became more connected to international affairs, both on teaching on, on and on, let's say, geo geoscience management activities. Uh, I was the, uh, the, the president of the International Union of Geologists, Geosciences in, the, geos in uh, the period 2000 to 2004. And then I became involved in International Year of Planet Earth, which we in fact uh, initiated uh, together with UNESCO. And that was uh, active in the period 2006, no, sorry, 2007, 2000, 2009. And uh, that was proclaimed by the, by the United Nations as an International Year of the United Nations, International Year of Planet Earth. Then uh, after that was finished, I retired from these activities and I was uh, involved in the creation of the Earth Science Matters Foundation, which we now are, uh, is now affect our, our uh, uh, field of activities here. So, and then, uh, well, I've not done much very much. I wrote a few books, but um, together with other people. Uh, but since then, I, um, I I live a quite a retired life. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Yeah. So, uh, Kambada uh, Moptini, would you like to uh, briefly uh, introduce yourself? Thank you very much. Um, my name is Kombada Mopieni and I'm a geoscientist. I'm currently the National Program Officer for Natural Sciences for the UNESCO Windhoek Office. But before that, I worked at the Geological Survey of Namibia for 19 years. 
I started as a mapping geologist and I went on to remote sensing, but on the side, I've always had a passion for geoscience communication and outreach. And I was also part of the Namibian team that engaged in the International Year of Planet Earth back in the days. And I also am a founding member of the Young Earth Scientists Network, which was uh, formed uh, as part of the Interna International Year of Planet Earth activities. And um, in my current job, I have a chance to advocate for geosciences on different platforms and engage policymakers and, and government officials who actually make decisions on geosciences. So that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. Now, uh, Dr. John Clegg. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, really. Uh, this is a great group of folks that we have on this panel. Um, and my name is John Clegg, and uh, I'm a supposedly retired geoscientist, but uh, I'll retire when I drop um, because I am never going to retire. I just uh, I, I feel blessed that I've had this uh, very long career, over a 50-year career in uh, geoscience. I started my career after uh, my PhD era uh, with the Geological Survey of Canada as a research scientist, and I held that job for 24 years. And then I decided I was going to start a company. But uh, before I could do that, I, I uh, landed a job teaching at a university in Western Canada, Simon Fraser University, where I spent 20 years, probably the best 20 years of my professional life because it gave me a chance to uh, communicate and to mentor students. And then I decided to retire a second time, but unfortunately I started a company. So I'm working on a trifecta now of jobs. Uh, this one involving uh, consulting where I kind of apply uh, my academic training in glacial geology, which I never thought would amount to have any real tangible value, but it turns out I'm a hot commodity in the private sector. So that's me in a nutshell. And I'm just really pleased to be part of this panel. Thank you, John. Um, then uh, Dr. Heather Handley. Thanks, Courtney, and thanks to you and Victoria for the invitation uh, to be here today. So I'm an Associate Professor of Volcanic Hazards and Geoscience Communication at the Centre for Disaster Resilience, which is at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. I just moved there last year, so before that I was in Australia in Sydney for 15 years, but my Earth Science Department closed. So I am a first-hand, I guess, witness and um, I'm not really a victim because I made a, a very good move, but um, first-hand experience of what happens with the, the lack of, I guess, uh, public support and interest in, in geoscience. And I also now hold uh, an adjunct professor role at the uh, Monash University in Melbourne. So my research is focused on taking a multidisciplinary approach to better understand how volcanoes work and what triggers volcanic eruptions in order to reduce uh, the risk from volcanic hazards. But I'm also um, you know, very much engaged in geoscience communication and also equity, diversity and, and inclusion. So I'm co-founder and director of the Earth Futures Festival, which was a, a new film festival focused on geoscience to showcase its role in sustainable development. Uh, co connecting the, the arts and science and I'm also a co-founder of the Women in Earth and Environmental Science Australasia Network uh, which now has grown to over um, a thousand members across Australasia. Great so last but uh, definitely not least uh, Dr Ian Stewart. Thanks thanks for that um, uh, yeah, I'm Ian Stewart. I'm currently based in Jordan in uh, in the Middle East at the Royal Scientific Society, but I've got a, a secondment, it's on a secondment here from the University of Plymouth, where I'm a professor of geoscience communication. And so that's that's my my kind of big thing is communicating geoscience uh, to kind of non-geoscience audiences, really. So I started off as a PhD student in earthquake geology in Greece and, and Turkey. And most of my work has been in the kind of the geohazards, but also climate change. Um, but in more recent years, uh, all my PhD students, all my research really has been around 
communication, particularly working with uh, social scientists and people in the and media professionals around how you communicate uh, science and why we communicate science for what purpose. So I'm also very closely connected with uh, UNESCO. It's been mentioned already from Ed, but um, involved with the International Geoscience Program, uh, where I lead a project on geology for sust sustainable development. And also I've got a UNESCO chair in Geoscience and Society, which is hosted at uh, Plymouth University. So that's that's me. Thanks. Great. Well, I am very excited for this discussion, and I look forward to hearing everything uh, that comes out of it. Uh, anyway, just to remind everybody, use the chat function below. I'm going to turn off my uh, mic now, and um, I will hand it over to you, Victoria. Thank you, Courtney, and thank you so much to everybody for coming here, both to our speakers and to our audience. I hope this can be as useful to everyone as possible. And we're going to cut right down to the questions. And the first question is for Mr. Stewart. So I would like to ask you to please identify the major changes within the geoscience space uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, so, so as to give us a perspective from which we can launch the rest of the questions. Thank you. I think, for, I mean, this will, everyone will have a different perspective on what the major change is. For me, the major change has been around the idea of societal relevance. Um, you know, when I when I was a undergraduate, postgraduate, early lecturer, it was it was a pretty it wasn't really something you necessarily had to talk about because um, most of the geoscientists were getting trained, were going into the oil industry, certainly in the UK, or into the uh, mining in, industry, and both of those were seen as absolutely integral to economic development, economic growth, not just in, in uh, developed countries, but more importantly, in developing countries. So, so there was a big push there. So it was clearly relevant to society. And then the other dimension was the area that I was in and, and the people like John Moran, for example, and Heather, hazards, uh, disasters, earthquakes, volcanoes. So you didn't have to go too far to demonstrate or to argue that it was societally relevant. The major change, I think, has been around about you know, the turn of the millennium when uh, suddenly these areas that were the, the natural heartlands for geoscience, particularly mining and, and uh, oil and gas, suddenly became the problem, not the, the seen as a problem, not the solution. So there you have, as I say, the, the fact that suddenly geologists were the people who were kind of rape and pill raping and pillaging the planet, putting into those, these, these really terrible environmental legacies that was the most obvious one, of course, being uh, human-induced climate change, but others believe biodiversity loss, et cetera, et cetera. So suddenly, just switch from being the good guys to the bad guys. Actually, we were never the good guys, I don't think, but we were kind of tolerated, you know. I think people, once they knew what we were, they kind of said, oh, yeah, well, that's quite useful. But suddenly then geologists, I think, ended up with this idea of being you know, the exploiter of the planet. Um, so I think what's happened really has in the last 10 years, certainly the last five years, has been a, a kind of, nav you know, geologists and geoscience organizations, geoscience companies trying to navigate where they are and what their purpose is and, and how, and people have taken different stands for that. Some have defended you know, the old uh, kind of business as usual practices and try to justify that in various ways. Others have jumped a completely different way. So for me, what I, I took on the role of a director of a sustainable earth institute and so sustainability, sustainable development became the new, um, the new kind of portfolio of activities that geoscience could, uh, could um, kind of organize itself around. And there were some obvious areas, economic mining was still in there and there was energy still in there, it had to be redefined in different ways. But I think that idea of re, of of talking about rethinking in a critical way, very self reflective way about what our purpose is, is something that's really um, captured uh, organisations in the last few years. Not least of which were academic department, as Heather mentioned and as mentioned Courtney mentioned in the start, which have really in many parts of the world, not all, but in many parts of the world, seen a lot less students coming into geology. Um, so there's this, in my view, a sort of disenchantment with geology that we've met, had over the last 10 years. And so so that's been a big, big change. I'd be really interested in hearing other people's views on what they see as the major change too. And that's precisely what I was going to suggest next. Does anybody else have to comment on the major changes on geosciences?
No, I, I agree with uh, Ian. Uh, I'm myself. I, I've not been involved in in uh, in recent development because I, I retired. Uh, uh, Ian is still very active, so uh, he has uh, a better view on on what's really uh, happening these days. So I leave it there. Yeah, and before we turn our discussion a little bit towards the solutions, uh, one more general assessment question, but now we're going to focus exclusively on the educational front. And uh, that, of course, uh, I would like to suggest that Dr. Clegg answered this question. What were some major changes in the educational landscape, so to speak, when we look at the earth sciences? Uh, thank you, Victoria. Uh, yeah, well, I've seen these changes. You know, I uh, started my career, uh, well, my education basically uh, 60 years ago, and it was a different world um, educationally and in every other way you can imagine. Um, you know, uh, I did my thesis work before there was an internet. Um, I kind of have seen these ra uh, really strong, important changes. Uh, in education that relate to the way the world is changing. You know, the world is totally transforming and uh, education transforms with it. So back when I was doing my uh, undergraduate work, for example, um, geology was geology. It was in a silo. Um, you didn't have uh, the kind of multidisciplinary aspects of geology. You, you became a petroleum geologist or you became a uh, engineering geologist perhaps, but there was very little um, kind of interplay between classic geology and other disciplines such as chemistry, uh, biology. And that's all changed. The, the the kind of the landscape has changed because now we have orders of magnitude more scientists than we did back when I started my education. It's just a larger community. There are tens of thousands of geologists in China, for example, which uh, wasn't the case 60 years ago. We're a global community. Um, the developments, the technological developments, developments, and particularly. Uh, the internet and the instantaneous acquisition of knowledge have transformed education. I think we have lost a little bit in that as uh, geologists, at least, probably geographers as well, in that when I was a student, we had lots of exposure to the real earth, tangible earth, getting out and doing field trips, one-on-one -on -one relationships with uh, faculty, and I think we've lost a little bit of that. It's hard for universities now to even mount uh, field schools, much less uh, give students other opportunities for real world um, learning. Um, so we're struggling a bit with that, I think. But um, on the other hand, we, we, we get together in meetings we, more than we ever have in the past. Uh, there's opportunities for um, provided by organizations that have grown like GSA and IUGS that provide uh, uh, opportunities for young people to get involved. So there are positives in all this. It's just that I think, you know, we're caught up in this maelstrom of change that more broadly um, impacts all of us in every way. And education is one thing that's kind of uh, undergoing this this radical change over time, uh, driven by technology and driven by new technological developments and driven by um, issues that have emerged. You know, the climate change, uh, sustainability issues, uh, they weren't there when I was an undergraduate student so long ago. You know, nobody thought of climate change as an issue. And now it drives a lot of uh, what we do, and it should. We should be jumping on board on that because we have a lot to offer. Would anybody like to pitch in their ideas? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, so I think, yeah, just adding to that, it's also now that the motivation of the students, you know, has changed through all this landscape of climate change. And there was a recent study, I think it was in 2021 in Nature uh, Communications that was showing, you know, what, what it was that was motivating students to undertake geoscience and 
you know, I I'm, I don't know if I can say I'm that old, but in my time, you know, it was the attraction to the outdoors that was a real pull um, towards a geoscience career. You know, that's why I really enjoyed it. That's what I love doing, like combining science with kind of this physical outdoor environment that I get to be in and this natural laboratory. But it showed, this study showed that the, the major factor, and they looked across um, a range of, you know, diversity indexes of who was filling in this survey, and the major um, reason in our motivation was that it was people helping people and society and helping the environment. And they also did ask the question about work environment. So how how much was it that it was working outdoors? And that was that was really low down the ranks. So I think it's also about understanding now what is, you know, in this changing environment we're living in with these pressing issues of global challenges of climate change. It's that students are also motivated. They want to make a, a difference to that. And so we also have to kind of, I guess it feeds onto maybe what we're going to talk about later, this kind of repackaging and rebranding of, of how we sell, sell the earth sciences as a, as an attractive career. Oh, that is, thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. I loved what you said. And uh, as a person who has been recently very uh, up to date with what types of programs universities offer their undergraduate students, what I noticed was absolutely astonishing, and namely some of the older aspects of geosciences, they were completely disregarded. Everything was being lumped in together with environmental studies programs. There was no longer this specific rigorous, you know, uh, mineralogy, petrology kind of study. And I'm not saying this is necessarily good or bad. I'm going to let the experts talk, but this is definitely a change that I even I, with a non-expert eye, I could definitely see. And I think that might tie into what um, Mr. Ian was saying uh, previously, that to avoid this kind of negative packaging on your major, people would rather go low risk and label it environmental studies as opposed to geosciences, which are perhaps more negatively associated with other aspects of the world today. But I'm not going to keep talking. I'm going to direct the next uh, question to Mrs. Uh, Heather. And namely, how do we repackage geosciences, geosciences 2.0? How do we share the reasons why geosciences still rock in the 21st century? Or, you know, maybe um, that is not needed at all. So please give us your take, ma'am. Thanks. Yeah, I think one thing that strikes me when I think about uh, physical geography, so for me, or at least in the universities I've been in, physical geography then became environmental science. And I kind of little bit feel a bit frustrated in a way, because if you look at environmental science, it's the fundamental aspects of environmental science are based on geology. You know, for me, it would be geochemistry. You know, you can't understand pollution or some of these aspects without looking at the chemistry of that. And that, that falls under geoscience. And so I feel, you know, that they maybe they got in there first to call it env environmental science, that we we kind of missed, missed this opportunity and somehow got a little bit left out as the geosciences. But I think this um, there really is a need based on the current challenges. I think the current challenges are an ethical one. So like we were saying, like Ian was saying with the, you know, mining and oil used to be, you know, regarded as uh, needed for economic prosperity. But now in terms of they're seen as negative aspects on the environment and for climate change. And so the perception in that sense, I think, is a challenge and it should be factored into the branding and the promotion of what we do. So I noticed there are universities around the world that are starting, and I know uh, Ian's been involved in this, in really promoting sustainable geoscience. And so I don't know if that's the replacement for geoscience. And of course, this background of, yeah, learning, you know, petrology, mineralogy, that all plays a role in building up this skill set of understanding the pollutants that you're seeing or the contaminants or the, you know, in terms of what you're looking at. And so I think we definitely need to be, I think some of the issues are that we didn't um, necessarily do well as geoscientists to communicate within ourselves and to how we market our courses, how we, you know, the content is all applicable to geoscience for society, but I just don't think we're really highlighting that specifically when when we when we talk to students. So I think some sort of just um, rejig of titles, repackaging and restructuring of these courses and to make sure that they really are clear that they're contributing to the things that people want to do now, which is, you know, helping people, society and, and protecting the environment. So and just raising the visibility of that and emphasizing the, the relevance um, to future generations of just how valuable and critical these skills are that geoscientists have. Does anyone else want to tackle the same question for a couple of seconds? 
don't want to uh, tackle it so much, but yeah, this issue of, I mean, an important, uh, really an important portion of geoscience is related to resources. And, uh, as Ian mentioned, you know, we've kind of given ourselves a bad name uh, in terms of, you know, how we treat the environment with resource extraction. Um, however, uh, that's changing. A lot of companies are uh, leading kind of the way in terms of minimizing environmental attack on the land. And I guess the question is, uh, you know, if I look at Canada, Canada would be a third world country without the mineral industry. It's extremely important in Canada. It's important in Australia. Um, so how do we kind of convey a more positive view of the resource industry while recognizing it's kind of very important? You know, if we want to, I've got a, an issue with uh, EVs, with electrical vehicles, but if we really want to develop that industry, we're going to need resources and we're going to have to have mining. And uh, people kind of are going to have to wrestle with the trade-off between living, having a high standard of living, if that's what we want to have, and uh, resource extraction and, and mining. Can I just throw a comment in there? Because there's a great uh, line that John Van, who's the chief geologist at Anglo-American uses, and I've stolen it from and I used that, which is any future with a lot less carbon in it is going to have a lot more mining in it. And I love that because it immediately puts the paradox back into the, to the you know, whoever you're talking to about trying to wrestle with this thing that the geologists are wrestling, which is how do we do mining for the 21st century? And, uh, and you know, that goes alongside that with oil and gas as well. So that's a, that's a good one to keep, keep in the back pocket. And may I add to this a little bit? Um, we, we presently look at the, some geopolitical changes. Um, I'm living in Europe, in the Netherlands, and um, here uh, in Europe, whole, the whole mining issue was was uh, put out of the of the of the di discussion because uh, nobody wanted to to make, make uh, uh, dirty hands, and uh, they they left mining up to other continents, for example, Africa, for example, well, Canada, for Australia, it happened already, but in China and Asia and whatever. So, uh, in, in, particularly in, in, in my part of the world, uh, people are now changing the, uh, uh, the narrative, for example. Then now, as uh, ge ge geopolitical changes, uh, we need to take care of our own resources more than we did in, in the past. We cannot simply rely on free uh, uh, trade and, and getting the resources from other, other areas. So even in, in this protective region as Europe, Everybody, I mean, people are now changing their, their minds and they say, oh, yes, we have to do some mining also in Europe. But then, of course, we should do it in a very sustainable way. And uh, But uh, that's, I think, the, the main point. How do we come to sustainable mining? And, of course, there has been done quite a lot of it. There are also the ICCM or whatever. that They're working on that. Uh, so, But I think that is a challenge, uh, which is now imminent in this case. Yeah, and I think that as well as the sustainable, it's the ethical aspects which are really doing a lot of damage. So especially in Australia, the reason why mining, you know, there was always this connection between mining and student intake, a little bit of a lag. So whenever the mining was booming, then the students would go up and go down. And so, well, I guess there's two points. One is that we need to, I feel, we need to disconnect, at least Australia does, this connection, this very strong connection, and really emphasize all the other things that geoscience does. Mining, yes, is going to be needed and important, but there's so many other things that geoscience does besides mining, and we need to disconnect this kind of um, linkage in terms of the stability of continued students' enrollments. But the other aspect is when you have, you know, two of the world's largest mining companies that are blowing up indigenous cultural sites in Australia, which they clearly knew about, there's no way you wouldn't know about those sites when you do your environmental impact assessments and your cultural heritage assessments, and they blew they blew them up. That gives such bad press that is beyond belief in a, such a culturally sensitive place like Australia that there is no wonder then that public perception goes so far away and then nobody wants to do geoscience. So even if as geoscientists within academia and the education system, we're trying our best to I guess, um, emphasize the importance and the value to society. I feel it's everybody's responsibility in anything geoscience related 
to take a better ethical approach to, you know, to sustainable mining, to ethical behaviors. And so I think that the geoethics and the sustainability aspects are going to be really important moving forwards to really make sure geoscience is continued. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Mopshini? Um, yes, I, I was going to comment on, on what the previous speaker said. I agree with the points. And I just wanted to bring in a slightly different dimension. So um, I don't have that many years of experience as uh, Dr. Clegg has or Dr. Demulder, but I also noticed the change in Namibia, for instance, going from the demand from traditional geosciences. Uh, on, in our side of the world, especially in Southern Africa, the enrollments have not dropped. Of course, there's a, a growing awareness on, on climate change and and also I mean we have the different dynamics most of the companies that are mining in Africa are from Canada from Europe and so forth and there is this awareness of saying that our rights people have to benefit from this mining sometimes uh, the mining is not as well regulated as it should be and I think what drives people to enroll in university this side of the world is is, is employment because um, we have quite a high rate of unemployment in Southern Africa. In South Africa, it's 40%, similar to Namibia, Botswana. So I think before you think about the climate and so forth, you want to secure a job. And most people are still the first generation in their family to, to work. And that means that when you go into geosciences or you become an engineer, you're not only going to support yourself and your aspirations, you're going to pull up your whole family from another class to the ne next level. So I think the dynamics are a bit different. Yes, we have environmentalists challenging the mining companies, but it hasn't yet uh, affected the student enrollment. I would ask a question is that shouldn't we as a community be asking more of our resource extracting international companies? companies because they are, as Heather mentioned, giving us a really black eye. And it's not just in Australia, it's globally, it's it's definitely in Africa. Um, and in South America, you know, the tailings, the uh the tailings dam failures. I mean, can't imagine worse press for, you know, the geosciences than a few events like that. So I think I'm not suggesting that all companies are rapacious, but uh, they need to. We need to be asking more of them and demanding more of them because uh, everybody else is. And I think until we kind of minimize those types of disasters and show that we're doing something as a community, we're going to be we're going to have trouble attracting young people, at least to the resource side of geoscience. I think that are. Big changes in the companies, though. I mean, I, I talk to quite a lot of them, and they're one, they know the problem, and two, they are addressing it. I think that one of the one of the problems is a narrative in the past about how you sell mining or, or even oil and gas has been economic. It's like it's an economic reality. It's how many jobs is going to be created, and and it's, as Combada says, that's it's still a really important element in many places. But in places like Europe, for example, that's much less of a strong narrative. But I think, you know, we all know, and this is actually the problem we're dealing with, we all know that mining is and mining companies going into the area are completely transformative. They, they, they completely transform a community and they do so for decades. And as I say, it's been a little bit one dimensional. It's like, we're going to give you suddenly all this economic development. But you, it doesn't take much to do a quarter twist to that to actually say that mining developments are actually social developments. Yes, they bring prosperity in, but of course, prosperity brings people in, brings high crime rates, it brings the prices of houses going up, it brings a whole bunch of things that's negative. And I think that what's maybe ha going to start happening is seeing the mine, a development of a mine as a social development that lasts for, for several generations of people. So that how is that mine going to help the education? How is the mine going to help people get jobs after the mine is finished? Because these are booming bus cycles, et cetera. Uh, because, and I think that's where the geoscience thing of that long time scale is quite useful. Because I think if we see these things as really long term social developments, then I think a lot of the broader good that, that we talk about around sustainability could come through. But if we just say, oh, yeah, we're going to give you loads of money and there'll be some jobs, um, some people will like it, the Chamber of Commerce and things like that will like it. But 
a lot of people will not be interested in that at all. And we'll have the same same problem. So I think it is partly a narrative thing. Um, but I, as I say, I do get a feeling that a lot of the a lot of the big majors are really trying to take this head on. Okay, that was a great discussion. And uh, in, in the same spirit of generating engagement from especially younger people to see geoscience as really useful and to want to engage with it, I would like to direct the next question to Ms. Mopcheny. So how, how do you garner support from a local audience to engage with different types of educational programs and with earth sciences in general? Um, thanks, Victoria. For for us, especially in Namibia, we are mostly welcomed. Uh, science is a big priority for the government, and they really want to up anything, awareness in science and so forth. So uh, we have not had a problem engaging with schools. However, I would say that we have had to learn on the way to change the way we engage with the schools just to be more impactful. And for instance, in Namibia, uh, even though we are a resource-rich country and we are very uh, active in mining, mining literacy, the actual literacy on what happens is very low. So most people don't really know about geoscientists, and as was mentioned by my colleagues, that most people just associate geosciences with mining, and they don't know about engineering geology or the hydrogeologist or hydrologist or all the other spectrums. And we are trying to to raise awareness that geosciences is not important only for people who buy diamonds, but it's for, you know, and we emphasize on everyday life. And people always get amazed to realize that the cables, copper cables, that the laptop and gadgets are literally relying on, on, on mining. So um, I think a lot of work needs to be done on literacy. Unfortunately, in Namibia, geosciences is not in the school curriculum. And as was mentioned earlier by the others, it's quite uh, exclusive in the university. I mean, we speak a different language. I mean, you say Precambrian to the average person, uh, they will not understand what you're saying. It's, it's just science language. Um, but the engagement, we've had positive feedback. And of course, I think uh, learning from past experiences at the survey, where we have participated in this international geoscience uh, outreach activities, uh, the feedback that we have gotten so far is that we need to do more engagement with the teachers because usually we come up with these ideas and we feel cool and excited and fine it might be but then the teachers say it's it's also time consuming for them because it's outside their curriculum so where we are looking at is wanting to engage more with the teachers so that it adds value to their programs and doesn't give them extra work and we've learned uh, hard lessons that we have to consult them on their exam Komala, can you hear us? Hmm. Victoria, I think we lost our connection and with Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Right yes. now. Can you please repeat the last one minute? I'm <laughs> sorry. I just so saw your face frozen. No, that's my. Oh no. Then from just. Oh my gosh, my connection. Did I break again? Yes, yes, but now it's good. I am really sorry. I oh my Wi-Fi. Okay. Can I switch off my camera quickly while I finish my contribution? Sure. Maybe that will help. Yes. Yes. I was saying that uh that it's important for the general public to be informed so that they are also aware and don't get swayed by rumors that they see on social media. For instance, we have this situation in the south of our country uh, on uranium exploration that might affect a major aquifer. And then we have this famous Kavango Delta related issue that you probably saw in the media because Prince Harry also had two cents to say about it. And 
uh, it's all about preventing people from being swayed by misinformation and also empowering people uh, so that they can approve tenements or licensing up with an informed way and not get swayed by the jobs that they provide. So that's it for me. Thank you so much, uh, Kambada. Would anybody else like to address the same question? How do we garner support from a local audience given specific geographic um, circumstances or challenges that we can- I throw one, one thought in, which is um, one of the problems is we don't train our geoscientists in this. <laughs> So we don't train them how to talk to communities. And they, well, it's not seen as a key skill. Our key skills are, you know, some of the ones you mentioned earlier on, are technical skills, et cetera. And, but the irony is, or the paradox is, that the geoscientists is often the first people on the ground. They're the ones going in doing the geophysics survey or the geochemical survey or something. And if they screw up, if they mess up and they're the first on the ground, then there's a whole lot of trouble waiting for the, the, um, the development later on. So it seems to me that one of the things that we need to do is to, to really think about that idea of stakeholder engagement as a critical geoscience skill, because the geoscientist is the boots on the ground. You know, it was one of the, I said earlier on, one of the attractions is that we are a field-based, you know, activity generally. I mean, not entirely, but a lot of the people around this, uh, around this screen are, are field-based people. Um, so I think that idea of really trying to take much more seriously the idea that there is a skill set in stakeholder engagement and community engagement, and the geoscientists should learn it. I'd, I'd echo that comment. I, I totally agree. I think that, uh, you know, I was trained as a hard physical scientist, and then I began to develop an interest in natural hazards, and communication became increasingly important. And it was like I was uh, learning on the job, so to speak, because I, as a, as a physical scientist, I was never, ever taught how to communicate. Um, you know, you give, you use your God given skills. Um, but I think it ought to be a more important, particularly because, you know, earth sciences is now bridging this, uh, divide increasingly between, um, social science and, and physical science and, and sort of learning how to communicate and teach are important skills. That was the other thing. When I went to the university, it was like being thrown into a swimming pool and learning how to swim. And it took me years before I felt like I was actually beginning to become an effective uh, teacher. And I mean, that's crazy in the in modern times is to throw in PhDs and PDFs into university jobs with no training in communication. I, Totally agree with Ian on that one. Yeah, and if I can just add to this general conversation, I think there's been a real challenge because when, say, at the point that geoscientists are going in, it's already too late in some ways for that communication to have happened because the communities that are there that are going to live with the consequences of anything that goes on near them, where the mining or wherever something's, they get very little um, opportunity to provide input into decisions that are being made in their environment, in their, you know, where they're connected to their their home and their country. And so I think changing this, if we think about something that, you know, geoscientists can also uh, try to improve through education and through um, what we try to communicate that uh, companies in terms of industry should be doing is this kind of, you know, participatory um relationships so you know as soon as there's a there's any potential in an area and a lot of this work one one thing i have as well now is with the movement of maybe even the on ground stuff going to remote sensing or to off you know stuff that's happening in satellites countries or locals environments don't even know that their area has been uh surveyed you know and then suddenly the government will say oh well through this remote sensing technique, this satellite technique, we've identified this area as a key prime area for mining of whichever particular uh, rocks or elements. And so, you know, they're so remote from all these decisions that are being made on the areas that affect them. And so I really think this participatory, at least, you know, before any before the geoscientists go in and actually do that survey, and there should be discussions with the local communities. How can we make this benefit? You know, what do you expect from it? And how can we make this 
you know, a win-win situation for everybody in the, you know, and what are the responsibilities that the, the companies are going to take to make sure that all these things we've seen around the world that happened in other places aren't going to happen here. And I think until that really happens, there's going to be, you know, it's going to be hard for uh, mining to really come into a region and have have this positive output. And just to, I guess, what this really co- was confirmed recently, and I said this to Ian as well, was um, when we ran the Earth Futures Festival, so this was a film festival where people could submit their films and the whole focus was try to promote um, the value of geoscience to society and sustainable development. Now, I am pretty much convinced that 100% of the films that came in, there were anything related to mining, were from the perspective of a community that were being impacted by a mining company. It wasn't, oh, look at this, you know, collaboration between these things to say, look, here's the jobs, here's the this, here's the positive, here's the how they've been responsible in the environment, and here's how it's benefited the local and, and wider communities. And so it shows that that is one, not happening, and two, that the, the communities are feeling negatively impact instead of positively impact by all these decisions that go on without any of their consultation. So that's that would be my my real, uh, I guess, advice to companies of how they need to change their behaviours. I will have Can to I say- add on to that. Yes, please. Uh, I, uh, adding on to Heather's comments, I think um, Maybe there's a need for geoscientists, more geoscientists to learn how to communicate because when we were, at least back in the days in school, you you had this, the profession was regarded as, you know, same as engineers. We don't need to explain ourselves. We are essential contributors to community. I'm studying geosciences. I mean, you hold your head up high when you're studying geosciences, but I think uh, there's a need for geoscientists to learn how to communicate because even here in Namibia, when we had these environmental challenges, the voices that were the loudest and the messages that were the clearest were coming from the environmental scientists and they have a very strong history of communicating things in a way that the communities understand. And whenever my colleagues at the ministry or the mining side tried to communicate, it sounded more garbled compared to the environmental scientists. And it's human nature. You listen to the message that is compelling, that touches all your, like that you are um, identify with. So I think there are positive stories in geosciences. For instance, in Namibia, we have a very low fatality rate. The mining um, in general, the environmental track record is good. But I think the positive stories are drowned by the negative stories because the other side communicates better and they lose, use uh, less jargon than we do. And they have a stronger history in media. And I think like now, for instance, in Namibia, if you go to a bunch of geoscientists and talk about geoscience communication, they think you are, you are going soft. So there's still that thing of, are you a real geologist like uh, doing petroleum or igneous pathology or structural. And then when you mention remote sensing has recently gained some dignity. When I started uh, doing remote sensing, they thought I was doing funny stuff. And uh, now you say geoscience communication and they just think that you just want to have an easy degree. Like, you know, people in geosciences don't take science communication uh, seriously. And I think uh, all the geological surveys should have a big budget for science communication and science engagement so that the the few geoscientists who are interested can actually learn uh, how to communicate properly. Because what happens is, oh, Kombara, you like talking, okay, do it. No, it's not about whether you like talking. There's actually a a science to it. So, yeah. Well, Kombara, don't you think that's changing though? I I see more and more geologists and geographers, you know, physical geographer, scientists speaking out. Um, so I think a change is afoot there to kind of add a little bit of a positive note. We're, but you're absolutely right. We're nowhere near where we need to be in terms of communicating our, you know, our discipline. Yeah, and unfortunately, one could argue that the consequences of that have been recently seen all over the world. But Moving on to our next question, when we communicate uh, geosciences to 
especially to the youth, but really to anybody who is inspired to learn about it. Here's a question for Mr. Ed. What makes the earth sciences valuable to our future on a global scale? How would you present that knowledge to someone? The microphone, please. Yeah, yes. yeah. Well, view science um, is valuable on a global scale because we we are the ones who can tell, we, we, at least we try to, to how the earth works, how it works, and what is in it, what is in the, in the, in the planet, and, and how uh, has the, been the past of the planet, but particularly how it works and what is uh, in it. So as we, we talked about the, uh, the, 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 the resources, the resource and whatever resource uh, is important, and that's, um, but particularly how it works also. Uh, we are talking also about uh, natural hazards and whatever, uh, that um, that affects society now. Um, when we talk uh, uh, to, 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 to uh, delineate the, um, the scope of our field, I mean, we are working for society, in fact, and that's uh, on a global scale. Um, Earth science for society was, in fact, the, the, the tagline of the International Year of Planet Earth by the, in, the, in the, the years 2007, 2009. Uh, but that is also was taken up by UNESCO as well as an important uh, background. Earth science for society. So we have to, um, for example, when we, we talk about uh, what's in it, what are the resources? We should not only talk about mineral resources or energy resources. And, uh, Water is a very important issue, which is uh, 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 perhaps not always acknowledged as such, but geoscientists play a vital role and have always done so, uh, and will do it in the future to play to to find the the uh, uh, the very important I mean, uh, the water resources because our 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 uh, humanity is still expanding at least I'll say to uh, ten billion people uh, is expected in the United Nations. Uh, so we all have to, to to drink water. I've seen you all drinking water. I'm not drinking water. Stupid me, but okay, you all drinking water. But that's sufficient of that. Um, not only that, uh, I also would like to draw attention on something else, which is also an important resource if we talk about the relevance of geosciences for the future and on a global scale. That is space, underground space. We are, uh, we are uh, also an item which is tend, people tend to ignore. Uh, uh, we, nobody talks about underground space because people don't know uh, that there is some space or, or potentials for space below our feet. Uh, we have more than 6,000 kilometers of space until you reach the, 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 the center of the earth. Okay, I, I won't recommend to go that deep anyway. But anyway, what important let's say let's take the first 1000 meters which is uh, pretty well uh, feasible to to explore and to and not only for what was in it and what is what uh, what are uh, what's a valuable that we talk about valuability but valuable in terms of money or whatever no but space underground space may be very important for example look at, at china for example they have a, a very uh, vast networks of underground cities now. They're developing that every year further, further and further. A lot of space, underground space, is, has become available to people and for just for society. Uh, also for strategic reasons, of course, but also and for, for storage reasons. You can store things without that. But underground space is, uh, I think, a potential of, uh, of, our, uh, um, of our discipline, which we can, we can explore and exploit much better than uh, uh, than has done in the past, and I see for for the for the for the foreseeable future, in the next fifty years, there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, that adds to the reason for our existence. I would say for for future generations on a global scale. I think that's what I would say. Can I, can I add to that? Because I think that's a really really important point. Um, because there's lots of things that geoscientists talk about as being useful. 
But um, the thing that really discriminates us from all of the other types of scientists is that we are the scientists of the subsurface. And I think that um, we've not really done enough to push that uh, because, you know, because people don't really have any understanding of what goes on down there and you know, call it the land below ground kind of thing. But it is that, you know, we, we stare up at the sky and, uh, you know, the stars and everyone loves the stars and cosmology and gets really carried away by space missions and all the rest of it. But up there, it's almost all empty and completely useless to us, by and large. It's interesting, but it's useless to us. And then down there is all the things that are really useful to us, uh, but it's still a lot of unknown. And I never really understood why we haven't really brought that together as a package for the public, which is that we are the, the kind of the astronauts of the subsurface. We are going down there and, and actually tie in together all of our science because to go into the subsurface, you need all of the basic elements of geology, all the petrology and you know all of the, the kind of structural geology and geophysics and all the rest of it. But as Ed said, you know, now the subsurface is taking on a new realm. Uh, we've got the underground space thing we've got with climate change, for example, with climate change. When you look at the climate um, predictions, uh, going on 2030, 2040, 2050, particularly in the tropical regions, you're getting to stages where human productivity can only last for two or three hours a day. Now, what will happen is a lot of those cities, a lot of that, those services will go into the subsurface. So cities will start to explore the subsurface in a bigger way. But there's other things too, carbon capture storage we might get onto. We might, but the idea of uh, you know using the subsurface. But I think what the subsurface gives us and as I say, it's very familiar territory for geoscientists, but it gives that sense of a frontier. It gives that sense of an unknown area. That, and we are the only scientists that can do it. We don't have to, you know, when we're talking in the sub, you know, if we're talking about hazards or we're talking about energy, we're always competing with other types of scientists that are also there. But the subsurface is our world. And, and I think that geology could do really a lot by trying to think about how we pull that narrative together and, and push this idea of us being the scientists of this new realm that's absolutely critical for the future of humanity. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, that's very important. I think this is a frontier in a way, you know, we're just beginning to better understand the subsurface and we're beginning to really understand that, hey, that is, I mean, aside from earthquakes and things like that, and volcanic eruptions, you know, there are lots of uh, reasons to better understand the deep, the deep earth. And uh, we're beginning to get the tools to do that. So I, I see it as a frontier for, uh, for earth science. You know, we're gonna, we, we probably will be capitalizing on that. And Ian's absolutely right. We're the only ones Geologists and geophysicists are the only ones who can do it. There ain't nobody else out there that have that ability. So we ought to capitalize on it. Well, perhaps uh, environmentalists will claim that they can do it the same, isn't it? Okay, unless anybody else has... Uh... Any other comments to the specific questions? I think we have um, a question from the audience, at least one question. And uh, I will lay, let Courtney uh, start our Q&A part of the panel. Um, hi. Um, yeah, there is one question from Frances uh, Verslos. Uh, she, uh, there, hold on, let me. Um, so when starting to communicate our science to the bigger public, should the point of gravity be with making people enthusiastic about the science or with making people more aware of the societal problems the science faces, such as um, the energy transition? I don't know, Ian wants to start or? <laughs> Great question. Um... That's a tricky one. I've spent a career doing the first, but I think it's maybe more the second. So, so we the, the bottom line is you have to make people care. People have to care about something before the next step. So, so I guess in one way, the way around this is uh, what we really need to know is what the audience that we're uh, you know uh, interested in talking to, what do they care about? 
Um, so there is definitely something you can do around um, entertaining, and that's the thing that I've really could been pushing. And that brings in a new, for sure, it brings in a, a new audience. But what you're essentially doing is entertaining and the kind of work that I was in is essentially a big marketing exercise that says, isn't geology amazing, you know? The, the, the bit that sustains it beyond that has to be have real substance to it. And that's where it has to be where I get to the second bit, which is we have to be able to really make a meaningful difference to, to the things that people care about. And that's what's been interesting in the last few years has been said right at the start, which is that people are starting to care a lot more about the environment and climate, things that always were kind of marginal to mainstream geoscience, really. And so, you know, as I say, it, it, there's a one of the issues we often have is um, is that people should like geology because of how useful it is. So, you know, we will pick up a mobile phone and say, don't they know what's in here? Well, actually they, they don't, but they actually don't care what's in their phones. And so it's trying to tell, maybe they should, but, uh, but you know, they care about lots of things. But what do they care about? If you can influence what they, you find out what they care about, and then you can say, well, geology is important to that, then you're on a better uh, better chance of reaching them. So it's kind of, I, I'm fudging it a little bit. It's kind of both. I think we shouldn't be scared of entertaining. You know, we can, we've got dinosaurs, we've got volcanoes, we've got some of the best tricks in the book, but we're still facing lower numbers and people not being able to connect. So clearly that's not enough. We have to connect at the level that people are actually care about. And I think that's the, that would be the big challenge. Yeah. And if I can add to that, I think um, I agree. And I think it's also a question of audience. So what's, you know, what's the audience you're communicating to and then thinking what is the impact you want to achieve from communication to that audience? So it's also designing through impact of your communication. So whether that's you, you know, one of the first steps is always to um, change minds. So this is changing attitudes or beliefs. And I think that's a very valuable area that we need to focus on, which goes into this societal issue. But you always need to do it really through enthusiasm, because, you know, you you know, probably from being at school and your best teacher, you know, the best teacher wasn't obviously, well, not always the favorite subject you had, but it was the most enthusiastic teacher. And so I think having both both of those two things goes together. And so there's also changing behaviors. So do you want to mobilize people to do things differently? Is building communities as well. So you want to provide this focal point, you know, where people can get together around around a particular topic and then also changing structures. So some of the communication that you want to do might be more focused on influencing policy or law. So really within this communication, and this was when you start to communicate. So maybe in those early days, you don't necessarily need to be thinking so much about, you know, changing policies and structures. You're just trying to communicate more clearly um, the benefits of geoscience to society and, and to do that but through, I, I agree, you know, it's both, it's both of those things if you can manage them. If it's okay, can I jump in as well and put my thought um, in and really gets initial grabs people, you know, the attention of people uh, is the excitement of yeah dinosaurs and learning it on a more high level perspective, you know, the volcanoes, the earthquakes, you know, the fun things, but the, the application of our studies is actually what's missing in the communication where people can come and actually relate to it or actually see the opportunities for themselves in it. So we, I think as a community, we're really great at highlighting the exciting parts of our, of our discipline, but we are, I think we can improve on showing the application. And you guys have touched on this many times through uh, today's session. I think um, this issue of audience is important. The best communicators are those who have some innate sense of uh, whom they're speaking to. And so there can be many different uh, kind of forms of communication from kind of interacting with an individual child over their dinosaur, you're going to have a little bit different approach than you will if uh, you're addressing a large number of people uh, in a, tele a television interview on, you know, a tragedy in Turkey, for example. So the, the best communicators are those who can kind of pitch information and enthusiasm. You've got to have passion and enthusiasm, pitch it to uh, the audience that they're talking to.
Yeah, I, I can definitely, if I may just two sentences, I can definitely relate to everything that has been said. Uh, both Mr. John and Ms. Heather touched on the subject of audience and also geography, obviously, in a place where there's not at all much mining going on. For example, my home, Moldova, there's really nothing you can mine other than limestone, perhaps, but even that is not going swimmingly at the moment. So in a place like that, it's really only maybe through entertainment that you can get people to pay attention to geology. Uh, for a long time, me and my circle of friends thought of geology as nothing more than a fancy hobby that you can do if you have a lot of free time on your hands. So, but even that is a good venue to get people interested in some of the more uh, rigorous, perhaps, uh, size of geoscience and all the other things that you've already mentioned. So. Another question that maybe we can discuss, and this is coming from myself, actually, but <laughs> um, is to look at the just, transi the just transition. It would be interesting to look at how can we support the transition? How can we give the tools to these employees or um, the students that are coming into these careers? How can we diversify their knowledge to be, you know, a more uh, flexible and adaptable to these um, possible changes in, in their region so that they don't have to relocate or um, lose their jobs? I don't know if anybody has any thoughts about this. You know, some of the best placed people to address some of these issues like carbon capture and storage are going to be the people that know about the subsurface, like we we're just discussing. And these are the people that are currently working in, in the jobs within the oil and the gas uh, and the mine, and, you know, mining and coal sectors that understand the, the subsurface of the earth. They understand the structure of the earth. And so... I think, you know, it's for those jobs, you know, there's a there's fear of the loss of those types of jobs in coal or fossil fuels moving away. But I would argue that, you know, they have got some of the best skill sets that we need and that need to be supported to transition into capturing the carbon that, you know, people are saying it's not enough. You know, we, we can't just reduce carbon. We're going to have to capture and put it away as well. So I think there's a real um a really important and critical role for those people not to lose their jobs, but for somehow to either get the support for slight retraining that's needed and then to, you know, as one sort of goes down, the other one might go up. So that I'm, I'm, maybe it's a little bit of a, um, what's the word, romantic view of how, how these jobs could be saved or not lost. But that's, you know, it's one thing that when we were discussing it, that I was trying to emphasize that these these skill sets won't, you know, can't be lost. We, we really need them moving forwards. If I could just uh, provide an example that uh, play, builds on that, you know, in Canada, Western Canada is where we produce most of, not all, but most of our hydrocarbons, gas and oil and uh, heavy oil from the, the tar sands. And um, well, we're going to have to transition away from that ultimately. But that can be uh, facilitated a bit more by governments. Uh, and you've got a large number of people that really know how to drill, for example. There's a whole industry around, um, you know, exploiting the, the technology required to exploiting hydrocarbons. Uh, why not gradually encourage them to, through uh, developing uh, passive geothermal uh, projects in Alberta, for example, where most of our hydrocarbons come from, uh, you know, get them with the support of governments to begin to uh, take advantage of passive geothermal technology, which involves drilling, the very thing they know how to do. Literally thousands and thousands of uh, people uh, are experts in drilling. Well, let's get them to drill holes that uh, ultimately exploit this untapped resource, which is geothermal. Uh, just one example. It requires a little imagination and, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, support from government. Well, more than a little, it requires a lot. But, uh, you know, I view kind of Alberta as just like a dinosaur. It just keeps going, doing the same old, same old without any imagination. And they can totally uh, transform their economy and benefit the environment by transitioning oil workers into something that's uh, a little more desirable than just pumping more oil out of the ground. 
I think just following up on that, though, I think one of the issues you mentioned dinosaurs, and I'm kind of think it's some of the problems sometimes is that we're the, the geologists of the dinosaurs. Like, I, I'm amazed um, how few geologists are actually that interested in carbon capture storage, for example. It's, a, it's seen as a very marginal area, and yet it's absolutely critical to, you know, the way we're going to get out of climate change. So even in the academic world, even sometimes in the professional world, um, you know, the, the geologists are very loath to change. Um, they're kind of fight. If geologists were the biggest skeptics of climate change, we spent a lot of time, a lot, and particularly in places like Australia, but even in most of the resource um, kind of rich nations, geologists were the ones actually really pushing against all of this. And I think it's the same now with these new, this tr just transition is as a sizable minority, maybe it's still a majority of fighting the change rather than saying look at the opportunities that's ahead and and it's weird because thinking about it, geologists have always been like that when plate tectonics came in in the 60s geologists hated it we really hated it until the 70s and then we started to make sense of because it. it was done by geophysicists in the oceans and nothing to do with the land and the land was much more complicated when james lovelock brought in gaia theory we hated it now we then we called it earth system science and we loved it you know and so so there seems to be this lag period by which geologists finally get it. And when we get it, it transforms us. But in, and I think we're in that period now where uh, some people have got it and are pushing ahead. Some people are just kind of confused and wish it would go away and we could just go back to the way we were. And other people are, you know, really trenchant about, no, this is wrong and we need to protect the way the business is usual. And I, and I don't know how you solve that. And maybe it's just a cultural thing. Um, but as I say, it is kind of funny. Maybe we're, that maybe this thing about how long you know, four and a half billion years of history has meant we're slow thinkers or something. We we take our time to make but these transitions. Ian, do you think this is typical for geologists? That's my point. Is maybe it is. Maybe it is. Maybe we're too slow. Well, I I don't agree. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not. I'm really not oh, sure. Yeah. Why is it we're all be always behind the curve? That's my point, really. Yeah. Part of human nature too. Maybe, yeah, possibly, very possibly. Yeah, it's a deep down human trait that uh, I think uh, probably that we've inherited from, uh, from millions of years ago that we don't like change. <laughs> there is something else though, which is uh, something that's occurred that I've noticed that over the last few years, I've did lots of interviews with senior geoscientists thinking of the future. And what, one of the things they say is actually there's very few geoscientists up there in management and in strategic positions. And I think that has absolutely got to do with lots of geologists going into company and wanting to continue to be a geologist. We love being a geologist. And when someone knocks on our door and says, hey, would you like to be a manager? We go, no, I'm a geologist. I want to be out there on the field. And very reluctantly, we move across. And I think a lot of the other um, the engineering and, and uh, you know science groups probably haven't got that deep, deep attachment to the subject they do. And they they probably move across. So so one of the issues we have is, is in the big committees and the policy areas, things like that, people aren't, they aren't geoscientists and they don't know what geosciences are. And that's a, that's a real problem for us. I mean, we can talk to the public as much as we, as we want, but actually there's a few places of real influence and they're generally government level or inter-government level. And, that, and that's where we need to see a big, much bigger kind of geoscience input. I mean, Ed, you were doing this for years, but I mean, I think that's the the key place that we're we're missing is really being in the kind of the corridors of power uh, place. I think there are indeed a very few uh, managers and CEOs who have a geological background. Uh, I, I I recognize this attitude you you described about my colleagues, uh, former colleagues, who, who who didn't want to take any responsibility on a managerial level, and they just like to continue doing what they did always, and they're still doing it until they drop dead. That's what I do. Uh, may I add on to this, um, uh, Courtney? Yeah. Um, 
Uh, we have a similar situation here in Namibia also. And uh, to add to that, we have some uh, geologists who uh, are not keen to change the way they communicate with uh, policymakers. Um, and I think that is also a problem because when you are asked to, to give reports to senior management or so forth, uh, we have incidences where people still keep their Precambrian and and uh, Jurassic and all those jargon in the things. And, and I think sometimes uh, some of the geoscientists that I have seen going into the leadership position, I think maybe the geology curriculum at the universities needs some additional, maybe there needs to be more business because there is uh, business uh, subjects targeted towards mining, but towards the geosciences, because some of them don't make such a smooth transition. And sometimes they are not able to properly advocate or bring the benefits to the profession. And also we have instances of geoscientists who are not all rounders, for instance, who do not understand the whole profession. And when they go to the top, sometimes I think they are not in the best position to, to implement the necessary changes or see the opportunities for the profession. So I think maybe the curriculum needs to look at those things. One thing I've noticed over my career is there's a, a gradual improvement in the gender balance of uh, earth science. Uh, it happened over decades and it's still, we've got a ways to go, but what we need is more uh, Kambadas, we need more Heathers, we need more Courtney's, we need more Victorias um, as communicators. You know, it's important that, uh, you know, we have a full representation of all the people that are attracted to earth science. So we need more females in these roles. And that just came to mind when I think it was Ed that said, you know, you will, you will find very few women in management positions in, in geology. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of unusual. I mean, it's hard enough to find geologists in those positions, but to find female geologists. A real, real difficult thing. So I think that's another way we could improve our ability to communicate is by having more, more females in positions where they they have that opportunity. And it's happening, you know. Like when I graduated, uh, you know, back in Queen the Queen Victoria's era, uh, there was only one female in my department, one female in in the undergraduate earth science program, and so. You know, things have changed and I'm happy. That's a, that's a positive improvement. Yeah, that, yeah those are really great uh, input from everyone. I'm just being uh, a little bit uh, respectful of time. I see we have five minutes left in our, our discussion. So um, I just thought uh, before we fully close off, uh, just to kind of, uh, yeah. Uh, recap a little bit. I, I think um, in one sense, I think just anybody who has earth science knowledge, I mean, if they've taken it as a minor in school or or have, you know, um, been exposed to it in any other way, I think it's important and to touch on thing, uh, comments such as what Heather was saying about the ethics involved. Um, you know, I and also there's often the the phrase that comes out because of the transitions and sustainabilities that, you know, because earth scientists are the ones with the knowledge, therefore they are the ones that are going to lead or be critical in in providing uh, the knowledge for a sustainable future. But I think, yeah, based on the points you have raised during the discussion, is we have to recognize we have to get the Jews scientists themselves to recognize what power they can uh, have and what type of influence they can bring to the table, uh, whether it's just within their teams at work or at a broader perspective. But I think anybody with knowledge should try to insert that um, in whatever way possible within their work or uh, daily lives to yeah, show the importance of um, the earth systems, how they're interacted, and what uh, impacts that they can have in order to 
uh, be able to uh, yeah, explore, uh, extract our resources sustainably or responsibly at least, and instill this ethical uh, geoethics into our ways of working, I think is really vital on actually building and in using our knowledge to build a sustainable future that is required. And whether that we still need the mining, so we need to do that. So we need to just be able to yeah, change the narrative and uh, bring that positive influence by instilling and incorporating our knowledge in the decision making. And I think by inputting our knowledge effectively into the process, then we can ensure that we're going to do our mining sustainably and responsibly and have limited uh, impact on society. Because, yeah, unfortunately, any action we do have on our earth, it will create some sort of level of impact. So we should keep that to a, a minimum, I think. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think also points that you've mentioned, you know, really trying to uh, bring awareness to the broader perspectives of the geosciences, not just the mining and the oil and the gas and um, the ex um, resource extraction, but also the other disciplines that are also very important and um, such as hydrogeology on water, you know, the natural uh, disasters, so uh, building resiliences in the communities, et cetera. Um, also, how to engage with teachers because we really need to bring the uh, the knowledge already to the younger generations uh, about the earth sciences. So, how can we effectively communicate with uh, you know secondary, elementary school teachers to yeah build the new generations of geoscience? I think that is something also yeah some critical in the points you've raised. Um, so I, uh, I I love that we had such a broad perspective of the the world, you know, having somebody from Africa, Australia, you know, Canada, Europe, Jordan, you know, it's really great to have such a great panel today and uh, such a diverse uh, perspectives. Um, and uh, anyway, I, I think um, I would like to thank you and I hope uh, and I would love to continue uh, co collaborating uh, on this issue with you all. So, uh, you know, definitely um, reach out. And uh, for everyone else, um, you know, it would be lovely to keep it in touch and for us, for you guys to follow um, Earth Science Matters and our activities, our Geo Insider page, uh, Victoria, uh, is actively uh, interviewing experts on various different topics of the geosciences to help communicate it. So uh, I encourage you guys to uh, sign on to our Instagram and Facebook and visit our website to check out those updates. Um, but before we sign off completely, Victoria, I think has one last uh, question to ask everybody. And then, um, then I would like to then say thank you and goodbye. Yeah, so thank you again, everybody, for joining. This has been fascinating, a huge learning experience for me as well. So thank you so much. Now, uh, because all none of you are tired, we're going to ask you to really quickly share with us some parting words of wisdom, uh, kind of summarizing maybe some of the, the ideas that you have already shared or adding new ones, uh, whatever you would like to say. That would be very appreciated. Victoria, I'm going to cede the stage to you for that, because I would like to hear what you think are the key messages. You know, you yes. are the future of uh, you yes. and, and people like you. And you're, you're amazing. And I think you should uh, kind of weigh in on what you think are some of the key messages here. So I'm going to give up my little spiel to you. Well, that is, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, well, I have not prepared an answer. So this is going to be very honest and upfront. I'm very grateful to all of you. I'm very grateful to everybody who's out there doing the hard work and trying to come up with a method to communicate the earth sciences. And we're just on the receiving end. So it's much easier for the younger generation. But uh, I, would, I would like to take away probably the most exciting part is that geoscience has something for everyone. It is there for any audience at any age, at with any type of um, abilities, uh, 
to say take in huge swaths of information detailed or just the interesting kind of entertainment parts of it uh, there's a place for geoscience in schools after schools as a hobby as a profession and uh, it should really be put forth for everybody to see it as such so this is my takeaway wonderful words thank you very much victoria uh, i also would like to thank everybody and Particularly my old friends who have seen for so long, not so, seen for such a long time. They uh, they're really grown up now. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been lovely to see old friends, uh, friends old and new on this one. For me, one of my final kind of party point will be, you know, uh, you know, geology has been fantastic for me. But you don't have to do. Geoscience, there's lots of interesting, important things, sexy things that's happening in the world, artificial intelligence, big data, all of this stuff. But if you're not going to be a geoscientist in the future world, you better hope that people cleverer than you are going to be because the, the challenges that's coming down the line over the next 10, 20, 30 years are absolutely huge. And geosciences will be absolutely critical to solving them. And so I think we need to try and communicate that message that this is the most, the best and most exciting and most important time to be a geoscientist. Yep. Now, I'll just add to that. So I think one of these big challenges that I'd like, I'd really like to see us do a lot more is about water resources and how that's going to be a major issue moving forwards and the gendered aspects of that. And so worldwide, every day, it's estimated that women and girls spend 200 million hours collecting water. And I really feel there's a massive role for geophysics and geoscience there to really make a difference to kind of break that cycle of just, you know, women being able to go and collect water and be able to spend more time on education and to, um, yeah, have these opportunities that I've had. From my side, I agree with everyone else. And I would like to add that uh, in Africa, geologists have a big role to play to support us catching up and making the best of the industrialization, especially in supporting us to have stable energy resources. So geologists are really important and they have a big role to play in energy, water, and just making sure that we can live a better life.